Welcome to a CMIA fireside chat. Tonight's topic, the Russian way of war. My guest, Harry Gorham. Um, and two years ago, I think he published, I think it was two years ago, he published a book uh, called Strategy, uh, the foundation of, of Russian art and strategy. Um, so I just want to welcome everybody to this uh, CMIA event. Um, you know, it's, it's great that uh, our professional association can host an activity like this and uh, provide some professional development opportunities for our community. And uh, tonight I'm really excited to uh, be doing a talk with uh, Harry Gorham, who is a PhD candidate, and this is his uh, subject of expertise. And uh, I, you know, like uh, Harry and I have been talking about this in the office because like this has already had significant benefit for us in terms of uh, just the first time I put this out on Discord that we were doing this, we we reached out, like people reached out into the community because they were very interested in what we were going to be talking about. And uh, we connected with uh, Dr. Jensen from the Canadian Forces College. We connected with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Strain, who's currently over with the Army Staff College in Latvia. And we started talking about lessons learned, the Russian way of war. And I like, I mean, not just a benefit for CMIA and our people, but uh, I mean, also some real benefit for the Canadian forces in terms of like, I think we're going to use that community to help us, uh, you know, build um, our a better understanding of uh, uh, lessons that are currently being developed in in the war in Ukraine. And what, what an awesome opportunity that was. So tonight, Harry, if you could just take like two minutes, introduce yourself, and then uh, I'll, I'll have my first question for you. And just for the audience, the plan is I have three questions for Harry. Uh, and then we're going to open that up to the floor for questions for him. Um, and he is perfectly comfortable with actually taking all our questions. Not all guests are. Um, his his depth of knowledge is that good. And he loves to talk about this. So my job is to rein him in because <laughs> we don't want to go too long. This is meant to be like a 40 minute podcast. And uh, and then at the end, I have the three rapid fire questions that I've stolen from one of my favorite podcasts which is the uh, U.S. Trade Ox uh, Mad Scientist podcast. I think they're pretty awesome. And they've got three rapid fire questions. I've, I've stole their questions. And I'm integrating it into this podcast as well, kind of as an homage to them. So Harry, uh, tell us a little about, little. I really want to know about like your uh, academic background and the uh, the doctorate you're working on currently. Um, yeah, well, 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 first of all, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, any uh, opportunity or, or platform that's uh, provided to, to, to talk about my, uh, my, my, my research uh, and my PhD uh, is, uh, is a privilege. So um, as uh, Lieutenant Colonel Holtz had alluded to, um, I currently am a, a staff officer at the Army headquarters uh, in the position of uh, G2 uh, uh, Ops. Uh, in, in terms of my background, um, I'll be quick, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk to some of my, I guess, more, more recent um, uh, education, if you will. Um, I do have a degree uh, in modern war studies at the, uh, from King College in London, uh, and currently I'm, I'm studying at the University of, of Glasgow uh, on a part-time basis, but uh, I, 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 please be assured, even uh, most PGR students will tell you that even if you're doing it part-time, you're still a full-time uh, research student. So I'm studying at the University of Glasgow, um, and my dissertation advisor is uh, Professor uh, Beatrice Hauser, who's kind of like on leave right now from the university and is currently teaching at the NATO Staff College, but I still have touch points with her. Uh, and I also study under uh, Professor uh, Hassin uh, Alia. And uh, both of their research focuses on, on strategy as well as, um, uh, but P Professor Aliyev in particular focuses on Russian um, and contemporary Russian security issues. But Professor Beatrice Hauser uh, focuses uh, more on, um, on, on, on the history of military thought uh, and, uh, and strategy. Um, and uh, for, as a graduate student, uh, my focus was on uh, Soviet uh, intervention, uh, particularly or my, my research area was in this Soviet uh, intervention during the process of decolonization in Africa. And I, I focused primarily on the 1960s and 70s uh, because that was a heightened period of, of, uh, of economic, political, and, and, and military involvement in that period uh, and in that region. Um, and there was a significant shift in Soviet foreign policy. Um, and uh, maybe perhaps we'll get into that in, in over the course of this. Uh, discussion. Uh, uh, but uh, currently, my research as a PhD student at the University of Glasgow is focusing on the early theoretical uh, foundations of, of, of Soviet military thought. Uh, and I'm quite interested in, in, in um, 
looking at the influences in which Marxism had on the development uh, and influence it had on, on some of the early Red Army uh, officers that uh, helped shape and mold uh, the theoretical foundations of, of Soviet and then I would argue uh, Russian or contemporary Russian military thought. Um, uh, and I don't think it's a debate. I, I think it's quite clear in, in, in the scholarship and in the research that uh, the influences that men like Svechin, Tukhachevsky, Bartholomew, uh, Trian Folyov have had in even Shaposnikov are still uh, prevalent uh, today now. They may be not practitioners of, of, of much of their, their theory, but certainly um, uh, contemporary Russian scholars and theorists still leverage uh, a lot of that uh, rich uh, literature. So, Perfect. That, that's great. So, Harry, um, I think the first uh, my first question for you is going to be about uh, the literature. Uh, what you know, what is out there to read? Because like I think for our audience, uh, it's important to know, um, you know, like where they can look beyond this. And, um, uh, you know, there's like you, I, and I also think maybe if you could just kind of give us like a a quick, you know, two minute blurb on but the so what of why this literature is uh, really important and how it's shaping uh, current thought and why you think that that's important. And then we'll go on to question two and we'll try and keep this one to about uh, five to six minutes. Certainly. And, and um, <laughs> I, I, I perhaps that if I if I'll, I'll try to keep it uh, quick because I'll, I'll focus that on what I see uh, as as being relevant uh, to, uh, I think, uh, even for not just for intelligence professional officers, but right. I, I, but I would say just just for academics. Um, I would say three contemporary works, uh, well, that I'm reading uh, and that have served as a foundation for some of my 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 later research would be for a King's College in London. Um, and two years ago, I think he published, I think it was two years ago, he published a book uh, called Strategy, uh, the Foundation of, of Russian Art and Strategy. Uh, and I believe that's published through Oxford University Press. I couldn't be mistaken. But but um, I think the significance of that or, or um, uh, Professor Friedman's work is that he leverages a lot of uh, imperial Russian scholars uh, like G.A. Lear, uh, Medyam, as well as other um, Soviet, uh, correction, imperial Russian thinkers that helped shape um, later 19th century and early 20th century military thought. And, and another one that would come to mind that, that Alpha Friedman talks extensively about in terms of the development of imperial and then later Soviet thought would be uh, Dmitry uh, Milyutin. Uh, who had a significant influence on the reforms that the Russian Imperial Russian Army initiated uh, after the, the Crimean War. Um, and much of their views on uh, strategy, on the utility of war, um, how to modernize uh, a, a, the Russian army to meet the contemporary threats and the geopolitical environment that Imperial Russia contended with between 1850 and maybe lead up to the, the Russo-Japanese War, it was largely influenced by, by, by those men. And, and I think that uh, um, Offer Friedman's work really provides a solid foundation and, and, and quite clearly makes that lineage in terms of continuity and consistency with regards to um, uh, Russian uh, thought. Secondly, I would talk uh, a little bit about a book that I just finished reading by Oscar uh, Johnson, uh, who I believe was also a lecturer at, at King's College in London. Um, my old university, I'm probably making a lot of references to, but they have a, a very strong department in, 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 in Russian, uh, contemporary Russian studies. But uh, he wrote a book, um, 2019, uh, and I don't believe it's dated even too, called The Russian Understanding of War. Uh, and it talks quite extensively about the theory and understanding uh, and the utility of war uh, that, that, that it, it serves, uh, not only for just Russian foreign policy, uh, but they're thinking about how it uh, how it influences uh, the state. And I think it's significant, uh, or I think that uh, uh, Professor Johnson uh, is 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 quite um, lucid in his writing because he leverages a lot of of theories that early Soviet thinkers um, wrote extensively about uh, in terms of the understanding of war. And what is a constant theme, even amongst the two writers that I mentioned, but I think hopefully as we talk about today, uh, in terms of continuity and consistency in Soviet and Russian thought, um, is, is that the Russians don't really de differentiate in terms of their understanding of war. For them, it is always and con consistently has been a political uh, instrument in which it's used uh, to achieve certain effects um, to shape favorable political outcomes. Um, but armed instruments is, is only one element uh, in terms of their understanding of war. 
uh, economic, um, diplomatic, and other tools, uh, which are exactly that, tools uh, which shape uh, policy and political outcomes. And I think one of the points that I raise or that I look at in my research talks about how it was very intuitive um, for the Soviets to adopt a lot of the lessons and understandings of war that imperial thinkers had, um, and as well in this contemporary day and age uh, within uh, a modern Russia, where its political system also view war in very in a very political, or that it's first and foremost a political tool um, to serve political purposes and ends. That line of thinking and and the writing and the literature is is quite consistent, and I think uh, Professor Johnson uh, uh, writes uh, quite clearly and provides a lot of evidence to support that argument. Uh, Harry, I've um, also heard you uh, talk about it as a, a continuum as well. Yes, yes, um, and I'll just ask that before maybe I get into detail, but but I have to leave, uh, end with uh, Professor Hauser's the evolution of strategy, which, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. I think is introduced uh, for many students at JCSP. Uh, but her uh, uh, her book, which is Cambridge University Press, uh, it, it, it writes, I think, quite clearly about some of the thoughts and the ideas of some of the uh, um, theorists in which Soviet scholars were all influenced significantly by, by Jomini, undoubtedly Clausewitz, um, as well as other uh, thinkers at the time, um, like um, Liddell Hart is an example. Um, had a significant influence in his writings about a scientific approach to the study of war. Um, Tukhachevsky, uh, Svechin uh, were significantly influenced by that British writer and thinker. Uh, and the evolution of, of strategy by Beatrice Hauser, I, I think, should be on, on every shelf uh, for every uh, professional uh, officer. And then I'll just add with, uh, with perhaps one book that I, I use uh, quite often in, in my, my research, and that's by a, a former Russian, uh, uh, well, a general, a former lecturer at the Frunze Military Academy. Uh, and that's uh, General uh, Sakavin, who S-A-K-V-I-N uh, for, so, for some of the listeners. And he wrote uh, a treatise, if you will, called The Basic uh, Principles of Operational Art uh, and, and Tactics, uh, in which he, he wrote a, a, a very, I mean, as you can set aside some of the ideological rhetoric, um, but he, he, he put very clear definitions to concepts that we understand today, such, uh, such as, uh, uh, and we don't necessarily are, think as being uh, related to, to current Russian thought, but things like mission command, um, area defense, uh, meeting engagements. Now, those I'm throwing out rather broad terms. But uh, in the wake of the First World War, and based on some of the Soviet experiences during the uh, Civil War, um, the Russians or Soviets, I should, should say, were trying desperately to introduce maneuver back into the battlefield after their experiences in the First World War. And then some of the observations that they made in terms of for, for how, they, how, how they viewed it, how mobility and mass was reintroduced during the, 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 uh, the, the, the Russian Civil War. They tried to develop those, some of those concepts and, 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 and develop a, a scientific approach to uh, validating their theories, uh, but also uh, putting them into a intellectual and academic forum so that they can uh, validate them. And, and Sackvin, uh, who I think lived right up into the 1960s, he wrote extensively. So I've borrowed quite a bit from him uh, with, uh, with regards to my research. That, that's awesome, Harry. That, that, what a, that's a great overview. And I mean, uh, you, you know, every time we talk about this, I, I kind of reflect on the fact that it feels like um, we don't necessarily attribute this depth uh, that the Russians really have or the Soviets have in terms of, uh, you know, understanding it. And, and we and, and particularly when you listen to the rhetoric in, um, you know, uh, the, the greater media uh, and the lack of understanding of the, you know, the deep thought and the culture behind this. Um, and, and I think those books would help people. But I think to help people with that point, uh, maybe we could start talking about like the early 1900s and into the 20s when this all kind of evolved and then uh, stepped through and moved through the evolution of uh, current uh, the, the current development of Soviet Russian military theory. Okay. Um, and, and maybe what I'll, I'll do then to, to, to perhaps for, for my benefit is to, sure. to I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, frame uh, my, my focus and perhaps I'll, I'll look at it and approach it in terms of stages, but but I'll, I'll yeah, maybe that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. the first period. So yeah. um, as I, I, I mentioned to you, like a lot of my research is focusing on those, that early theory, uh, that, that that early period of, of 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 the development of Soviet military thought, and I would say that that's the early that that period really uh, was between 1917 and uh, and 1941. And as I alluded to, um, in the wake of the First World War, um, 
uh, with the establishment of the Red Army and the understanding that the, the Bolsheviks had required or needed uh, a professional cadre of officers uh, to be able to develop a, a, a military, a professional military that would be able to, to defend um, the, the, the Soviet state, uh, which by, by, by 1918 was already experiencing a number of existential threats, not necessarily just from the German army, but of course, uh, threat of foreign intervention. So the Bolsheviks uh, had seized power uh, in a revolution and it toppled most of the institutions uh, of, of Tsarist Russia, uh, which included the Imperial Russian army. But one of the things in which um, the, the, the Soviet military did benefit or the Bolsheviks did benefit greatly from was is that there was an influx of professionals, military specialists, voyeni spoyetsi is what the Russians refer to them as. And they were a cadre of young officers. Now, many of them perhaps were, were, were heavily or significantly um, immersed in, 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 in Marxist ideology, uh, or some of them as well were just patriots, and they believed that the Bolsheviks had provided the Russian state with the best and most viable option. And many of them became extremely patriotic, particularly after the, the Germans uh, renewed their offensive in 1918, and as well with the threat of foreign intervention, and as well just the collapse of, 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 the, of the Russian state. Um, so many of them flocked around the idea of developing a professional army to support the Bolsheviks. Um, and as a result, um, under the initial leadership of Trotsky and men like Mikhail Frunza, who, who was somewhat aptly termed uh, the, the Soviet uh, Klauschwitz, um, they did recognize the need to develop a, a professional uh, uh, officer corps, uh, which, which in some ways was, was for many Bolsheviks reprehensible because the idea of an officer class ran, ran contrary to their notion of, 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 of class warfare and class distinction. Um, but, but men like uh, uh, Trotsky and Frunza uh, uh, understood that in order for the Soviet state to, to, to retain some of its sovereignty and maintain a centralized control, because the Bolsheviks were all about retaining a centralized form of control over, over this large landmass that they had just inherited from the collapsing uh, czarist regime. Um, so this professional Audrey, uh, uh, officer corps, um, in, in many ways, they, they, they were able to recruit a lot of bright young minds. And particularly, I think all of us are familiar with men like, uh, like Tukhachevsky, but also like one in particular named Boris Shapoznikov, who was a colonel at the time, who was, I should say, a colonel into the, the, the Tsarist army. But he served both under Trotsky and Frunza. And he wrote a number of treaties about uh, how the, 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 the Red Army needed to reform and, and, and how it needed to be reconstituted uh, under this new construct, as well as the threat, pending threat of a potential civil war. But Shapoznikov believed that uh, what the, the Red Army needed uh, was to clearly identify and determine clear political goals and, and objectives, which was one of the lessons learned that many Imperial officers had had in the wake of the First World War, was that in many ways, the grand strategic design of Imperial Russia was not necessarily clear. Um, so Shapoznikov, um, later on, he wrote, wrote a series of, I think, very relevant uh, 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 treaties and works, particularly the brain of the army. But he had believed that a strong command and control needed to be exerted. And as well, there was always this traditional debate within the Imperial Army in which the Soviets had inherited about the role of a main general staff. Um, and uh, Trotsky had believed that that main general staff should serve as the component within the army that devised and, and implemented um, the military and the campaign plans that had been devised uh, by, the, by the party's leadership. So Sapoznikov made that clear distinction that there was a role for the political entity or the Bolsheviks, I guess, or the Communist Party, if you will, while it was up to the Red Army staff, the RKKAS, uh, to implement um, the strategy along military lines. And following in the wake of Shapoznikov uh, were also other theorists, um, or I should say other officers, that had served quite well in assumed command positions uh, in the Russian Civil War, like Budyeni, uh, who maybe was not as deep a thinker as men like Tukhachevsky and Frunza. Um, but anyway, just perhaps maybe just for the sake of time, um, for Shapoznikov, Tukhachevsky, and Svechin, um, they had realized that based on their experiences uh, in, in the Russian Civil War, that there was opportunities to introduce concepts at the operational level that would reintroduce theories that would be related to maneuver uh, on the battlefield. Because as I've said, their main effort was to introduce mobility and maneuver. Uh, and something which was was not experienced uh, and and uh, one of the basic flaws uh, 
of the First World War. They also didn't understand things like the changing nature of warfare, the impact that technologies would have. So those lessons had a significant impact on men like Tukhachevsky and Svechin. And later on, uh, between 1921 and 1923, they began writing a series of, 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 of articles and books um, that would lay the foundation for an academic curriculum at the Red Army's Academy, which Trotsky as well as Frunza had recognized was needed to educate this new class of officer corps. Now, what was unique about that initial period is, is that many of these officers too were being exposed to um, some of the works and theories of, 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 of uh, Lenin, as well as other Marxist writers like Engels, uh, who had significant uh, theories about how uh, modern wars uh, would be conducted and the changing nature of warfare. Um, and, and Engels, I don't think a lot of people appreciate, was one of, one of the first military historians to write extensively about how technology was going to shape and influence uh, the modern battlefield. So um, perhaps, we, we, you know, this could be its own separate podcast. But one of the things that Franz and Tukhachevsky and later uh, another uh, theorist uh, that worked in the Red Army Academy named Varfolomy wanted to, to convey to some of the junior elements within the Red Army leadership was is that what they needed was a doctrine that identified the political as well as economic and social realities of war, but also the changing uh, how technology would change and influence uh, future conflicts. And, 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 and as true Marxists would, uh, given the fact that, uh, and based on Marx's or, or, or even uh, Lengel, uh, Lenin's dialectics, is, is that we, we, we'll also have to accept the fact that from a Marxist perspective, that war is first and foremost a, a social political activity. They accepted as such and then recognized that in order or how they believed and forecasted future wars to be expected was largely based on their experiences in the uh, Soviet or the, during the, the, the Russian Civil War. And then, of course, during the Soviet Polish War, in which, again, was an experience uh, for them, which reintroduced maneuver and mobility. A lot of the Red Army structures were built around cavalry armies uh, where they were able to conduct deep operations and penetrate. Uh, into the rear areas of some of their adversaries, uh, particularly the White Army. R Wrangell had experienced this in the South uh, against uh, Budyeni's first cavalry army. So based on a lot of those experiences and uh, based on what they believe to be future trends, largely um, for those reasons that the socioeconomic conditions of, of warfare were going to, be, to change, largely meaning that war was going to become much larger. It was going to occupy much more space, more economic resources. Um, and that led them also to another assertion that they did not believe that wars could no longer be fought through decisive engagements. Um, they believed that the Napoleonic period repre represented a separate epoch in military history, but therefore, as a result of the changing socioeconomic conditions of society, and the changing nature of technologies, it no longer allowed decisiveness to be achieved on the battlefield. And then getting back to what I mentioned earlier about some of the lessons that the Soviets had learned during the First World War, was that, again, they could no longer achieve decisiveness on the battlefield. And based on the sheer size of armies, they were dealing with much more complexity, command and control, logistics. And based on that, they believed that they needed to develop an operational level of, of war so that they can achieve operational level successes. So that link between strategy and tactics. They can no longer conduct broad developments like uh, Schlieffen had planned for on the, on the Western Front against the French. What the Soviets had recognized was that they needed to develop the operational force constructs needed to achieve operational successes. And what that translated the, into was quite clear. Definitions and terminology such as uh, battles along the flanks, frontal attacks, penetration, and deep battle. And the purpose of the deep battle was largely that, uh, was so that they would be able to penetrate into rear areas where they would be able to degrade the economic, social, and industrial capacities of a country, which would ultimately translate uh, into, uh, into a, a military and political victory. So I hope that's perhaps maybe clear. I try to condense that into as, as, as short a time span as I can. But for that, me, that, that, was, that was great, Harry. It's, uh, you know, I'm going to have to rewatch this video to get all that information. I took a few notes, but yeah, that was awesome. So that takes us up to what, 1941, right? I, I would say that that takes us between 1920 and 1930. But between 1930 okay. and 1940, 
um, there, within the Red Army, there was a, a continuation of, of much of those theoretical debates that I had mentioned about. It wasn't until 1923, actually, during a lecture that was given by Svechen at the Red Army Academy, that the actual term of, of operational art was used really for the first time. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and the premise of Svechen's lecture was exactly that, as I, as I hope that I was able to articulate, is, is mm -hmm. that in modern war, uh, decisiveness in battle could no longer be achieved, uh, largely because, as I've mentioned, the sheer size of armies, uh, which were becoming more robust and capable based on technological advance advancements in weaponry, uh, defensive uh, tactics, uh, so concealment, barbed wire, had a significant influence on, on how uh, modern armies would conduct defensive operations. So they mm -hmm. needed to make that link between tactics and strategy, which was called operations. And Svechen had articulated it within a, a lecture, uh, which was then uh, put into a, a series of, 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 of actual ac a curriculum, if you will, by a, a theorist also called Varfolomy, who based on Svechen's formula, if you will, started to develop and argue that the Soviets then needed force constructs to develop these types of operational campaigns or plan for. And so in, 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 in much of the later Soviet force doctrine and structures, we began to see first and second echelon forces as introduced as early as the late 1920s, uh, where they talked about shock armies um, that would be used as second echelon forces to conduct penetration and, and deep battle operations where some of their motorized rifle regiments or divisions would conduct some of those battles along the flanks. Um, but it all comes down to the fact, I know that, that in a lot of the, the, the discussions and theory, uh, theoretical debates, that is, you know, there's this idea that, that for Russia, you know, the god of war is artillery, which is a tool on the battlefield. But I would argue, which is a common feature in, in, in much of their literature, is, is mobility, maneuver mm -hmm. and mobility, and mass. So um, I think that that is is from if you're talking to a, 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 a Soviet general in the 1960s, it's mass mobility um, on the battlefield. Right. But but those are enabled by fires, aren't they? I would agree with you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Yeah, very much. so. <laughs> All right. Perfect. So uh, yeah, in the interest of time, I mean, we're still doing OK. Um, do you want to talk about, uh, you know, post-World War Two then? Um, yeah, and, and well, I think 1941 plus. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about yeah. So so maybe um, those series of, of theoretical debates, and, and that probably itself is is another a podcast. Well, certainly from my perspective. Okay. Um, but in the 1930s, yeah, there was there was a number of of, of um, uh, um, other Soviet theorists that had contended with the view because what I'm also I should have alluded to is is that the offense. Uh, became the, the principal form of military action. And that was adopted largely based on Svechin and Tukhachevsky's theories about uh, the, the, the operational uh, level of war and where the Soviets needed to focus and concentrate in order to achieve victory in war. Um, but but in, in, in the late 1930s, men such as Voroshilov um, who was essentially the, 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 the chairman of the, of, this, of the Soviet main general staff um, between, well, in the 1930s and in the 1940s. And he had argued that uh, the, the, the Soviets, uh, based on some of their economic um, limitations, uh, needed to adopt a, a, a more defensive-oriented strategy. And largely there were political reasons for this as well. Uh, uh, Stalin had believed that the Soviet Union was not in a place to conduct uh, offensive operations and largely towards um, but by the end of the 1930s as well, the Soviet leadership also began to have a different perspective of the international system in the 1920s and 30s. Um, the concept of, 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 of socialist revolutions occurring within the West was still very uh, prevalent and prominent. Um, the, the, the Soviet leadership um, uh, under Lenin and then early uh, under, under Stalin had still believed that there was opportunities to achieve um, socialism and, 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 and socialist revolutions uh, would, would have an effect uh, in, 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 in other countries, like in, like in Western Europe, like I've said. But by, by, the, by the late 1930s, Soviet foreign policy began to shift, and so did uh, Soviet thinking about the utility uh, of, of war and the role of the Red Army. Um, so by the 1930s, um, there was a shift in some of its focus uh, where it had adopted an, uh, more of an offensive-oriented strategy to align to its foreign policy and internationalist view 
uh, which was very much founded in, in the concepts of Lenin. And that was that socialism was inevitable. Um, but in the 1930s, that view was, was somewhat rather limited by, by certain realities. And the Soviet leadership under Joseph Stalin had believed that, that, that they needed to take a much more pragmatic approach. And, and looking, e even though with, with perhaps their involvement in the Spanish Civil War, but they viewed that the rise in fascism in Europe needed for them to refocus and to reemphasize. So they began to develop a much more defensive posture, um, which arguably had cost them significantly um, by, by, by 1941. Uh, the Molotov-Rippentrop Pact, in, in many instances, was just the way for the Soviets, arguably, for the Soviets to articulate uh, that they needed more time to be able to rebuild, uh, to modernize. Uh, they had just come out a series of purges, which had a significant effect on the Red Army's leadership. So Stalin had even recognized just uh, before the uh, before uh, the, 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 the German army had invaded uh, the Soviet Union um, in the lead up to June, um, that, that Soviet Russia was quite not in a position to conduct a protracted military conflict uh, with, uh, with Germany or even Japan for that regard. So they adopted a much more defensive uh, posture and began to, for instance, you know, change uh, some of their doctrine and tactics. And even they began to remove uh, or began to dismantle some of their heavy, heavy armored mechanism, uh, mechanized uh, elements and units uh, and, and, and shifted some of their focus from, from some, from of their uh, shock armies, as well as um, their tank armies, uh, which had a much more offensive and aggressive role. Uh, and, and, and I think th that in itself would, would probably occupy a significant amount of time. Some of the strategic um, uh, uh, issues that, that had contended the Red Army and the Soviet state. But even then, um, looking as to how uh, when they regained the strategic initiative by probably 1943, we can see that uh, the Soviets began to reintroduce some of the concepts and some of the force structures they had believed as well from their experiences uh, fighting the Germans um, just to the east of Moscow. And then later, of course, um, when the, the, the Germans attempted to take the initiative in the south, uh, and then, of course, the six armies uh, 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 collapse and surrender at at at, uh, at Stalingrad, and then later Kursk. Um, once that strategic initiative had clearly shifted to the Red Army, we began them seeing we began seeing that they were reintroducing a lot of the concepts and theories uh, that had been articulated and espoused by men like Tukhachevsky and Varfolomey. And by 1942, of course, the Soviets began to reintroduce uh, elements like the shock army. They began to place more emphasis on, on uh, some of the, the core and army units uh, where they introduced more tanks um, so that they could provide um, their, 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 their fronts uh, with more uh, uh, ability to be able to conduct those battles along the frank, flanks and affect uh, envelopments uh, at the operational level, uh, understanding quite well um, that the, the German army had very uh, limited uh, manpower and reserves to be able to reconstitute and to make up some of those uh, losses. So after the, the defeat at Kursk, um, the Soviets, I would say, their strategy became much more politically focused. So up till then, uh, the, the, the strategy was largely to be able to attrite uh, and to continue to be able to reinforce areas in which the Soviets would be able to maintain um, their war effort. Uh, but after 1943, Overall, uh, their political objectives in the war uh, shifted quite clearly, and much of their military strategy and doctrine focused on those four structures and uh, their war planning uh, efforts to, 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 to destroy the German army to the west of Poland, as an exact correction, west of Warsaw, their efforts to, to, to seize uh, much of the Balkans, was largely formulated around political designs. Um, and then you see as well by 1943, a lot of the, 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 the Stavka staff were also beginning to reintroduce pamphlets, um, the, some of the teachings and lectures within the, 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 the military academy began to focus on um, some of the writings and teachings of men like Varfolomiev, uh, Shapozhnikov, um, where the political objectives um, clearly had defined um, what the, or the military objectives, I should say, would, would align quite clearly with the political objectives. And that was quite clear uh, within the construct, of course, of the Soviet system where the Communist Party uh, devises and is responsible for both the, the political direction of the state, but also the military doctrine. But in the wake, and I just want to get to, to perhaps maybe the post-war period, um, in the wake of the First World War, um, the, we, the Soviets also began to see once again uh, 
that there was a change in the nature of warfare. Now, we began to see a terminology being introduced like a revolution in military affairs. And that was largely a result of their understanding as to how nuclear uh, weapons uh, would change uh, the nature of, 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 of modern war. So that period, the revolution in military affairs, if you will, is, is I think most, most uh, scholars would, 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 would characterize that as being between 1953 and 1959 where the Soviets had realized that, that with the introduction of nuclear weapons, the nature of warfare itself would change. But this also had a significant in, in influence in terms of how the Soviets viewed war and the utility of war. Uh, under much of, of Lenin's view of the international system, which was traditionally adopted and then carried on, even Stalin, uh, in many ways, still had adopted and, and largely just regurgitated of Lenin's view of the international system, that, that, that they social systems of socialism and capitalism would eventually uh, 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 um, come to a, or it would result in a, in a global uh, conflict, uh, protracted struggle between the two social systems. But nuclear, the introduction of nuclear weapons had changed that calculus. Now, not so much under Stalin, but once uh, the Khrushchev had come to power, um, he wanted to focus more on some of Russia's strategic nuclear capabilities. As 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 uh, uh, relying solely for, for not necessarily relying so much on strategic capabilities, but he had believed that an effective deterrence capability uh, with the West, uh, uh, developing that strategic party, so catching up with the West, i.e., the United States and some of the other Western powers that had already developed this capability, there was a need for the Soviet Union to develop, and and the Soviets by this time between that period began focusing significantly on their strategic missile capabilities, largely as a mechanism to, 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 to deter, but also to be able to build up their strategic and power projection uh, capabilities. Uh, because even though they began to question whether or not war was inevitable, they did believe that the nature of warfare was changing and that it was going to be dictated by technological developments. But in addition to that, um, and, and, and I think there's sufficient scholarship to support this, the Soviets still believed that they needed a capable and robust, flexible response uh, to be able to contend and deal uh, with uh, the growing military threats posed by NATO, as well as uh, U.S. military technological capabilities, um, their strategic bombing, bomber capabilities, the fact that the United States did have an edge with regards to its missile technologies and some of the advantages in which the, the Americans had at sea with uh, the, their, their carrier battle groups, their ability to be able to project power, not to mention some of their strategic lift capabilities and logistical capabilities. So the Soviets believed that nuclear technology or their ballistic missile systems had served a very political purpose that they could shape or that they, they could curb uh, US policy or NATO or Western aggression solely based upon this strategic capability. While of course they still retained a sizable the largest land mass or land military uh, in, the, in the world, um, which served its own capability or its own purpose uh, in Europe. Um, but as well, what we see, I think, uh, towards the end of that period, uh, where Khrushchev, after the Cuban Missile Crisis in particular, based on the, 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 uh, how the Americans were able to demonstrate uh, what would be construed as flexible response, which is, I think, how their, their, their policy was termed at the time, Based on America's growing role as well uh, in their efforts to curb uh, the growth of socialism in places like Southeast Asia, their ability to blockade in other socialist countries such as Cuba, led the Soviets to develop or re-enter into another period where they began to develop, even though there was a significant buildup in terms of their nuclear capability from 1960 to 1968, we still see that they began to develop uh, a, a, a force structure uh, that was more flexible, largely because as well under Khrushchev, uh, when he began realizing that no longer was war inevitable based on the nuclear capabilities and threats that nuclear weapons themselves had posed uh, to humankind. Uh, because based, if you believe the dialectical uh, or historical dialectics of, of Marxism, uh, we see or we know that that socialism inevitably will succeed and triumph over capitalism. And they believe that narrative quite literally, or at least, if, for instance, you know, that 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 type of ideological rhetoric was pounded into their foreign policy and, and their 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 policy uh, statements. Um, but certainly in the 1960s, uh, we see the Soviets began building up some of their uh, naval capabilities. They began building up some of their strategic lift capabilities, 
solely along the basis and the purpose of 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 uh, defending and supporting what they had believed were trends and changes within the international system. So once again, we're seeing the nature of warfare change, largely uh, because the the social political context of history or or or, or of, uh, of 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 the global society uh, during that particular period changed. In the 1960s, because of the growing influence uh, and military might of the Soviet Union, they began to see advantages um, in which they could, could, could um, they, they would be able to exploit in the developing world. They began viewing by 1965 and 1966 that the Americans were in an untenable position within Vietnam. Um, we see that during the process of decolonization uh, in Africa, um, that there were opportunities for the Soviets through their, their their military support, through either their transfer of weapons, that they could achieve political ends by supporting black nationalist movements. Um, they could support other Marxist Leninist vanguard parties that were beginning to emerge in the wake of the collapse of, 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 of the imperial footprint of, of France and Britain. We see this within the Middle East, um, where, where the Soviets clearly began to support uh, many of the Arab states and Arab nationalist movements. Um, they supported them militarily and politically. And they did this all in uh, for the purposes of supporting and reinforcing socialism. So in this regard, we see how warfare or how the Soviet military served a very clear a political purpose, and that was to uh, uh, reinforce and support um, Marxist-Leninist parties, uh, Arab nationalist movements, or uh, Marxist-Leninist vanguard parties. Um, and they began developing the force structures that they needed uh, and the power projection uh, capabilities. Now, in the wake of, of Vietnam, um, when the United States began to look for a, 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 a opportunity to, to, to extract themselves from that conflict, uh, the Soviets were also at this period willing to enter into a, a, a period of detente uh, with the United States. Now, I think this is where um, we in the West um, certainly I, I have forgotten a lot of the lessons of the process of detente, uh, because uh, much of the language that, that was used, uh, diplomatic language, ideological language, our understanding of the process of detente in the West, that is, was much different in terms of how the Soviets understood it which draws excellent parallels today in this particular, this contemporary society. Under the process of detente, the Americans saw this as an opportunity to realign the international system. You know, under Kissinger and Nixon, they believed that no longer did the United States have the economic, military, um, or political influence or clout uh, to solely uh, affect or influence um, politics or influence events by using military or other economic instruments. They needed, to, they recognized that the world was becoming somewhat more multipolar given the rise of, 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 of Soviet military projection capability, uh, the rise in the influence in which China had or began to have within the developing world, particularly with some of these Marxist Leninist vanguard political parties um, using maybe South Africa and in Rhodesia as examples of that. Um, and um, and so the, the, the Soviets seeing uh, this very much along the lines of Marxist historical uh, material or dialectics, as well as Lenin's uh, view of the international system or the inevitable decline of capitalism in the wake of imperialism's uh, withdrawal um, from, from, from some of these uh, um, uh, colonies. Um, and so the Soviets believed that they now had opportunities, but they also then had responsibilities. And you see within some of the, the, the literature particularly in uh, the 19, early 1970s anyway, where they began to constitute wars as just and unjust. And a, a just war uh, was one which would be initiated uh, and fought in defense of socialism. And, and we could probably have our own separate discussion about that. And there was a lot of literature that the Soviets began developing as to how they justified and rationalized uh, their involvement in places like the Middle East uh, for the purposes of, of helping to... Um, deter uh, Israeli aggression uh, in Southern Africa to help uh, some of the, the black nationalist movements such as the ANC, that they had a right, an inherent right to help develop socialism within some of these countries. Vietnam, of course, is another example. Uh, and we can, we can go on and on and on. Um, and so you, you began to see, for instance, a, a massive expansion in terms of the Soviet fleet, um, some of their strategic airlift capabilities, as I've seen, uh, or I, as, I, I've, as I've mentioned, but the Soviets were still rather cognizant of the fact that, that if, if, if there, there were still red lines 
uh, clearly that were defined uh, by, by the United States as well as the other NATO allies. Um, so as an example, if you look at their intervention or their involvement in places like in Ethiopia, the Soviets had recognized that a mass influx of Soviet troops uh, to help support uh, the Durga's uh, um, uh, seizure of power in, in, in Ethiopia uh, would not be acceptable uh, to the United States or the West. So, so you know, they introduced Cuban soldiers to help fight and help train uh, Ethiopian Marxists. Uh, they used code Cubans in Angola as an example. So there are still very clear red lines, but their concept of war and the utility of war and their application of war, particularly in the third world, was largely developed around their view of the international system. So once again, we see how under Brezhnev um, and, and, and other key members of the Soviet leadership, there's one individual within the Soviet Politburo, an old time Bolshevik named Boris Ponomarov. You just have to read some of his old transcripts because he was he was a diehard Marxist and a diehard Bolshevik. But he believed quite clearly and he was within the, the Politburo. And he also served within the International Department that functioned under the, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union almost had like their own separate cabinet, if you will. Uh, and within that, there was a, there was an element called the International Department. And, and there were really brilliant Soviet diplomats like Karen Brutens, and but not so much with Boris Ponomarov. He was an ideologue. But anyway, getting back to my initial point, if you listen to some of his writings and lectures that, that he would give to, to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union or their party congresses, the, the, the direction that the Soviet Union was, was headed in is that they, they believed actually that the world was going their way. And that's a quote that it's also, I think, a, a title of a book about the, the history of the KGB's involvement in the developing world. But by 1973, and with the introduction of the process of detente and some of the strategic arm reduction talks that the U.S. wanted to initiate with the Soviets, they saw this really as a, as a period of decline in capitalism and imperialism. Uh, and so that they believe that it was their role. I think I'm maybe repeating myself, but just to reemphasize, um, we see a significant expansion in terms of Soviet military power. Now, um, the opening, and now even though we're seeing the developments of that capability between 1969 and, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, I would say 1973. Between 1974 on, we have the United States believing that they've, they've entered into a series of diplomatic negotiations with the Soviets that would tentatively and possibly curb Soviet behavior as well as the arms race. But that is not the case. And as I've said, and I think hopefully I've clearly defined what explained uh, the Soviet increase or their involvement in the developing world. But I would say that opening era of power projection was really defined after 1974. And, and, and maybe I did get ahead of myself, but we do yeah. begin to see uh, significant involvement in, 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 in Southern Africa, um, more diplomatic activity in, in, in other areas of the world where the Soviets have finally, they believe that they have achieved strategic parity with, with the United States and political influence that, that is on par uh, with, uh, with the United States. So um, I hope I, I summarize those periods or those blocks somewhat. Arguably- oh, Harry, We're way over time, way, way, way over time. You know, and probably people are wondering how we actually get any work done when we talk about this stuff at work. Uh, uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, that, but that was awesome. That was a great um, summary. Uh, I mean, obviously there's so much more to talk about. Like a few times you alluded to the fact that that's a whole nother podcast. That's a whole nother podcast. Um, so maybe, you know, people will give us some feedback and, and maybe we could do something like this again, uh, because there are some really interesting areas to get into. I, I'm not going to ask you the third question, uh, but I'm sure something related to it uh, will come up uh, from the audience. Um, and when it does, uh, um, you need to talk about uh, the how the Soviet state prepared the people um, uh, for warfare and the psychology uh, psychology of that and and you know the continuation of politics and warfare uh, related to the population as well because I think that's a really key issue in today's world um, related to uh, the current conflict. So there's a few people who have uh, put up some questions and I, I just want to give them write a first refusal first and then if you could use the uh, hand button that'd be great. So the first one was from George. Uh, George, it's up to you if you want to ask the question or not. Uh, just please unmute and then uh, then go ahead. Or if you uh, want to bypass it and go to the next person, that's fine too. Please let me know. Sure thing. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, we sure yes, can. Perfect. All right. So thank you for the presentation. It was, it was really good to explore those different 
eras of, of Russian and Soviet doctrine. Uh, so my question is, uh, and I'll just read it here. So is the Russian way of waging war playing catch up to the ways other great powers wage war? Or are there true innovations in their methods and theories? Thinking back on the ways that Russia tried to emulate the West after Peter I's trip to Western Europe, including adopting the Table of Ranks, perhaps this was not a one-off phenomenon of a Russian monarch, but a longer-term tendency well into Soviet times and doctrine. I was curious if you had any insights on this. Um, well, that's an interesting question, uh, uh, George. Um, I would say that yes, you know, like like, like Russia has constantly, uh, I think, seen itself in, in in a state of geopolitics, competition with the West, uh, and and there are, there are historical examples uh, that would probably rationalize and justify their view of of, of the international system. I would say though that um, along or using historical examples to to that they would use to to, to try to define or 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 perhaps um like if you're if you're talking about how they've emulated other great powers in terms of their force structures or uh for instance some different types of cultures i would say that in many instances um the 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 certainly starting from the napoleonic period that there were many cultures uh and even force structures command and control relationships um, much of their uh, views about how a general staff system and work would function, as in an example, was largely influenced by Jomini, um, who was one of the first directors of the Nicholas Academy, which was constituted or which was established in 1825. So in terms of emulating like Western theory and Western thought, like Imperial Russia wasn't the only country at the time as well that was trying to learn and adapt uh, largely from, from the experiences of the French Revolutionary War, if I could use that as an example, because I think within the context of modern history, that's probably one of the best. So if we look at how Napoleon revolutionized modern warfare, no, Napoleon really just introduced concepts and organizational structures um, that were first, um, I think, advocated by a French theorist called Carnot. But outside of that, Many of the other uh, uh, European countries at that time attempted to emulate the the Armée de Corps system, the divisional system, but as well, um, like Napoleon's strategy of the of the center, Napoleon's idea of 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 developing a continental staff system so that he could establish some command and control construct um, over uh, a, a broad core system. Uh, that was emulated by the Austrians um, and to some extent as well by the Prussians uh, in the wake of, of their defeat at, at Jena and Auerstadt, obviously. Um, but with that being said, too, um, in, in, in the 19th century, we also see examples of how innovative uh, uh, the Russians were. There's one Russian theorist in particular called G.A. Lear, and many of the Soviet theorists that I talked about in the 1920s, like uh, like Svechin, um, uh, Varfolomiv, uh, Shapoznikov, they, they, they borrowed a lot of the language and the literature from G.A. Lear that it advocated and, and tried to make it quite clear um, that, that, that the, the Russian armies did not have the capacities or the capabilities to be able to fight large, grand, decisive battles like in the Napoleonic period. So that they needed to develop more robust force structures to fight, even though the term wasn't there, at an operational level. So they were thinking about that 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 link between strategy and tactics. I would argue um, even before the Prussians were, or they were introducing these discussions along the same lines. And just another point of history that I would also like to allude to that many would even argue that the the, the Prussians were the first to develop a robust academic uh, construct to train. Uh, and to inform their general staff officers. But arguably, the Imperial Russian general staff began to do that as well by the 1920s and the 1930s. Now, there was more of a serious debate uh, under Nicholas II about the utility of having a general staff vice having a minister of war. Uh, within the Russian experience, they believed about putting all of their authorities under a minister of, 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 of war because he can control expenditures, he can control doctrine and whatnot. Uh, and only include having a main general staff during times of war to advise the Tsar and to advise the minister. The Prussians had evolved to a, a particular general staff construct earlier, but the imperial, the, the imperial Russian, or the the, the Russians, um, like G. A. Lear, were having these discussions much much earlier, or 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 during 
in parallel, I would say, or argue at least uh, with uh, with the Prussians. Now, there may be some that 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 could uh, that would probably push back on that, but there is some scholarship to suggest that the Imperial Russian uh, Army w- was looking at some of these constructs to train, to develop, and to establish more um, definitive command and control. But more importantly. To help institute reforms um, during periods of peace, when when the Russian army and the respective czars had understood that that reforms were needed. So I hope that maybe answers or addresses some of your question from my perspective. Uh, that was great, Harry. All right, rapid fire question time. So uh, tell us what you're uh, currently reading right now. Uh, currently. Um, I am trying to uh, work my way through a book by uh, uh, Forrest A. Miller called Dmitry Milyutin um, and the Reform Era in Russia. Um, and it, it, it's it's a, 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 a book or a work that was written, I think, in the 1950s by an American or he's Amer- a, a, an American scholar. I think he lectured at Cornell University. Um, and uh, he, he he's writing a little bit about the, or he's focusing, I should say, on the reform period um, that the uh, Imperial Russian Army went through uh, in the wake of the Crimean War, uh, understanding that they had issues related to logistics, command and control problems, but also technologically from some of the lessons and observations that they had made um, during that war with 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 the, the French and the British and the Turks. Uh, was is that they were were, were technologically um, limited in their ability to be able to match uh, with uh, with some of the advancements uh, made by the Western 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 armies or Western powers. So it's 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 a little bit of a dry read, but but uh, certainly from a from a scholarly perspective, yeah, it's, it's not a page turner. <laughs> it's 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 not a page turner. But I, I guess from a personal level, I'm also reading um, uh, a book by George Orwell called The, the oh, Road. Really? To- the road to Wigan Pier. So that that's on my oh, nice. night. Okay. And I, I pick away that at night. So it's been on my shelf for a while. I've been trying to read it and finally getting around to it. So okay. So I do have a question from left hand maybe maybe uh, Simon, and but I, I think I'm going to do the rapid question r- rapid fire questions and then and you know then we'll come back to that one because I, I, it's a good question. Um, so, you know, considering this is going to be posted on like YouTube and every single podcast, uh, you know, type of uh, platform out there, um, you know, like uh, uh, like about 15 of them. Um, keeping that in mind, uh, can you tell us uh, something about yourself that most people don't know? Um, I, 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 I have an interest in, in, in um, U.S. history and politics and um uh, I guess as a way to maybe um, uh, draw my attention away from from my research, I find that I, I watch a lot of Richard Nixon documentaries. Um, so I'm fascinated with with Watergate. Um, I, I'm also uh, quite interested in in um, in uh, uh, Kissinger, his foreign policy and and U.S. foreign policy at that time as well. But but getting back to I think what I said I, I I'm a sucker for Richard Nixon documentaries so anything I can get my hands on or if I can watch something or find something on YouTube I, I'm fascinated with with the man not his politics um, but uh, but certainly his 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 foreign policy and yeah. um, the Watergate scandal I find is a uh, is an interesting case study in in political espionage uh, if uh, if you will nice okay. And the last one, which uh, you know, the uh, mad scientists always say is the uh, the hardest question, uh, is uh, what's your favorite movie? Oh well, in line with that, um, I think um, what comes to mind now is all the president's men, right? About um, Watergate, uh, yes, yeah, right. So Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford, right? Robert Redford, Dustin Hoffman, um, I think uh, Hal Holbrook, uh, who plays okay. Deep Throat. Um, and uh, Jason Robards, yeah. So some 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 good actors. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a movie that I, I uh, like to watch uh, periodically. So yeah. Okay. Hey Harry, that that was great. Um, uh, thank you so much for doing this. I I I found it fascinating. I am actually really going to have to go back and listen to some of the things again and make more notes. Um, and uh, I'm really interested to. Uh, if not read some of those books, maybe read the Wikipedia pages on them, um, because this is such an important topic in terms of like trying to uh, we we mirror image too uh, too much, 
And uh, it's more important to have a better understanding of uh, like who we're up against and how they think. So I do want to go to um, Lieutenant Navy Simon's uh, question. So uh, he said his mic isn't working. So uh, perhaps I'll read this off uh, myself and, and unless you want to give it one more uh, try. Yeah, so I'll, I'll read it. So he said, um, regarding the earlier mention of war as a political tool, what is the favorable outcome with the invasion of Ukraine? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I would say that um, that 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 the, the war in Ukraine, um, which could be constituted as a proxy war, um, is is an effort on the part of of, of Russia um, to to prevent first, I think, Ukraine uh, from aligning itself closer to the West. Uh, I would also think that uh, if uh, the if Russia is in a position to weaken Ukraine politically, economically, um, and if they're able then to to demonstrate that that Western resolve um, or deterrence um, has either failed or is in limit is limited, um, then it would weaken further uh, NATO. Um, and as in addition to that, I think Russia saw that there was an opportunity. Uh, based on their view of, of the international system, that, that NATO and a um, divided, domestically speaking, uh, United States uh, would not demonstrate or show the resolve needed uh, to deter uh, Russia uh, from either seizing uh, through using military instruments or tools uh, or further weakening uh, Ukraine uh, and their ability to, to, to align itself uh, further with uh, with the West, um, so I think th that that speaking um, and, and we can't we don't know really what the mindset of the Kremlin's leadership is, um, but I think that there was a a, a clear political objective uh, militarily. Um, I think what we saw was that um, the the Kremlin and Putin uh, had believed um, that um, Ukraine was 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 much weaker militarily and and politically. Um, so the, 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 the tactics um, and the, the intent to use perhaps military uh, force to achieve uh, whatever their decided or their outcome was, uh, which we know now is to, to seize Kiev, uh, topple the Zelensky government and put in place uh, a proxy uh, government uh, to align itself more, more closely with, um, with, with, uh, with Russia. Uh, but I think with that being said, Russia is also fighting the war that it didn't plan for and uh, and, and didn't attend uh, to fight. Um, so so I, I think um, they, they're, they're lacking a very definitive campaign design. Uh, they, they were from the onset. Um, they lacked a very clear command and control construct. Uh, and even though they may have had clear political goals, um, they obviously lacked the military instruments to be able to achieve uh, any decisive uh, military results that would shape a, a, a favorable political outcome. Perfect. That, that's great, Harry. Um, yeah, once again, thank you. And uh, I'd love to get feedback from people, uh, you know, both who participated and on YouTube. Um, you know, uh, if there's something that uh, we could potentially do again in the future. I mean, obviously, you're very passionate about this topic and extremely knowledgeable. Um, so uh, perhaps you will uh, come back at some point in the future and uh, join us again. Oh, I would love to. And uh, yeah, it was it was a real treat. And uh, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the opportunity. And and uh, yeah, please feel free to uh, reach out at me, uh, reach out to me at any time. Um, yeah, if you have other questions or comments, uh, yeah, then please, I look forward to it. Okay, thanks. Um, have a great night.